What do you get when you add salt to pulped coffee? A lactic process fermentation. Maybe? Let me explain. This is the third video in a series on specific types of coffee processing. I learned about all three methods during a week-long fermentation training camp with coffee processing specialist Lucia Solis. I'm Roaster Cat, and I attended Lucia's workshop in January of 2023, and now I'm sharing what I learned with you. In this video, we'll go through the lactic process, which uses a salt solution to change the environment of a fermentation, encouraging the dominance of lactobacillus, a bacteria commonly found in milk, yogurt, cheese, on plants, in soil, in our guts. Lactobacillus is pretty much everywhere. We'll get to the processing in a minute, and a quick note if you missed the first video that showed the yeast inoculation, now's a good time to watch it. The intro to that video shows the pulping process in more depth, explains some of the equipment and tools we use, and lays a good foundation for understanding what's happening in this video. So check it out if you haven't seen it, but if you're ready to move on, let's go! The first step when receiving the coffee was to immediately submerge it in cold water. This cools the cherries down to halt any fermentation that may have already started, and it allows us to do a primary assessment of cherry quality called a float. Higher density beans sink, which is an indication that they're fully ripe, but cherries with defective seeds, insect damage, or unripe cherries will float. These floaters threaten to reduce the quality of our overall batch, so we remove them at this step. After cooling and floating in water, we spread the coffee cherries out on raised beds in the shade to sort out any additional cherries we don't want, mostly green unripe cherries, and we take some initial measurements. Again, watch the yeast inoculation video for a full explanation of these tools. After sorting the coffee for a while, we spread the coffee out on the raised beds and let it sit overnight. We're going to be doing a washed coffee with this process, so the next step was to pulp the coffee, which means removing the skins from the seeds. This small machine, called the depulper, pinches the coffee cherries and removes the seeds, what we call coffee beans. There's a thin layer of fruit sugar called mucilage left on the seeds at this point, and that's what we want to remove with our lactic process. The main purpose of this fermentation method is to harness lactobacillus to break down that sticky mucilage layer, leaving our coffee parchment clean. We got a clean coffee with the other two fermentation methods as well. For the yeast inoculated coffee, we added a large charge of a specific yeast in order to dominate the fermentation. In the citric process, we added citrus juice or citric acid to dissolve the coffee's mucilage and skip a fermentation altogether. In this lactic process, we are adding an external input to the fermentation, like we did in the yeast, only we want to use bacteria as the main driver in this fermentation, rather than yeast. Specifically, we want lactobacillus, which is what makes this a lactic process. But I'm going to let the expert explain in more depth. So for the lactic, we're going to make a fermentation that is dominated by bacteria versus dominated by yeast. And in the yeast, what we did is we selected the yeast, we grew it up, and we added the yeast. So I know, I have a lot of confidence that the yeast is fermenting that. Here, for the bacteria, I'm not adding bacteria. I'm changing the environment. I'm adding salt. It's like a filter. So the salt says, lactic acid bacteria that tolerates salt is welcome here, and everybody else is not welcome here. Mm -hmm. Right, because the salt is a good barrier, it's a good screen for other microbes. Changing the environment, I'm not adding bacteria. So all I want to do is add like this, like add just enough to cover it, but I know I want about a 2% solution. I'm throwing a party, and I have DJ, my doors are open, I have food that doesn't mean people are going to show up. Maybe, maybe they'll show up, I hope they show up but it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So in this way, I'm just setting the stage and I'm hoping my lactic bacteria are gonna dominate and we can have a good fermentation. With the yeast, it's like I threw a party and I made all my friends show up. I drove them and like, you come to my party. <laughs> That's what we did there. So it's that level of certainty. Like, do we, how confident? I'm very confident here. Here, not so much. And at what point will you know whether the lactic bacteria is here or not? I really don't ever know. Mm. Unless I oh, do DNA analysis. Mm. Okay. I have to do DNA analysis and be like, I am sure. Mm -hmm. This is salt, and the, the reason why it's this color 
is because the most important thing if you're going to do this process is non-iodized salt. Because the iodine, as we know, iodine is antimicrobial. We put iodine and we don't want an infection. Because yeah, tengo mi sal, tengo agua aquí. This salt is also really difficult to dissolve. Oops. What's the temperature at that level? Oh, it's very cold actually right now. Warmer, it will dissolve more. So warmer is better, but I don't want to add like hot water to my coffee. So if we were doing this at a bigger scale where it mattered, you could maybe do some really hot water and let it cool down before you add it. But it's not as important as uh, controlling the temperature as it was with the yeast because the salt's not living. Correct. Salt is not alive. I don't care about its. <laughs> I don't care about its feelings <laughs> the way I care about yeast's feelings. Mm -hmm. So in order to create this environment that encourages lactobacillus and discourages other yeasts and bacteria, we added a salt solution to the coffee, 2% salt by weight of the coffee plus water. Note that we are not adding milk, whey, yogurt, or other lactic heavy ingredients. Perhaps some farmers do, I haven't seen it, and it seems like it would be expensive for a farmer, especially if they're doing larger batches and lots, to add a bunch of milk to their coffee. Also, it might impart other flavors that we wouldn't want in our coffee. Again, I don't know for sure, I haven't seen it, but overall, the purpose of this fermentation is to remove the mucilage, not to heavily impact the flavor of the coffee. Back to you, Lucia. So this is another point that's very particular to do as I say, not as I do for the <laughs> workshop, is every time we're touching our coffee, we're contaminating it with whatever we've got going on. And we've got a lot of people and a lot of hands and a lot of, of our own yeast that we're imparting on the coffee. So it's bad practice, but it's good learning. Mm -hmm. The best way to mix this, not your hand. I like plastic, something that's easy to clean, not wood, metal, because of these really low pHs, there's a lot of opportunity for corroding. So, okay, if you do uh, stainless steel, but that's expensive and heavy, so just a plastic paddle sort of implement is easier. And for me, I like touching the coffee because I do want to know when is it so sticky? Mm -hmm. When is it um, losing its mucilage? Like, it gives me feedback, but it's not something I recommend like touching all the time because it, every opportunity you open it is a contamination opportunity. Okay, so now all I wanted to do was add this filter and now I'm mixing it in. And now we're just gonna leave this alone. So you were saying with the uh, lactic, you don't know necessarily if the that bacteria is there. So if you see something that says- I know that, that says, it's there. I mm, don't know that it's how much dominating. It's, uh, I don't know how much I can contribute mm. how much of my results I can say. It's 100% mm. because of my lactic bacteria. So now we need to cover it and we're gonna take it with all of the other ones. Six hours into the fermentation and you can see something is definitely happening. The coffee is rising in the bucket and we could tell there was some carbon dioxide trapped in there. Lucia washed her hands and arms really well and gave it a stir. Very, very warm. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Yeah. Oh. So this, this bubbles from the fermentation? Mm-hmm. Oh. Remember, this is not ideal. I, I could have put uh, just like alcohol spray on my skin before sticking it in here because I just rinsed it after that one. Remember, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> The top was a lot warmer than the bottom, so I'm glad that I'm mixing. We take our measurements. At 20 hours, the fermentation was continuing on strong. At every step, we took measurements of bricks, pH, and temperature. Again, check the yeast inoculation video for an explanation of those metrics. At 44 hours, the fermentation was continuing, though it was a slower and more gradual process than the yeast inoculated, which was to be expected. There was still some mucilage on those seeds, so we left them a little while longer to continue that fermentation until all the mucilage was removed. Now at 68 hours of fermentation, our bacteria is still alive. You can tell because it's still putting off carbon dioxide bubbles. 
but the mucilage is all removed, so it's time to wash and dry the coffee parchment. We add a bit of clean water, stir it around, and remove any newly discovered floaters. Then we thoroughly wash it with clean water to remove the salt, any lactobacillus or other microorganisms that might be present, and the byproducts of the fermentation. Once the coffee was really clean, we laid it on raised beds to dry. Do you smell the parchment? It still smells clean? You know the five day fermentation? This fermentation was long, five days if you count receiving and pulping. However, the coffee was clean, not super funky like you might expect if you saw extended fermentation on a coffee bag. The point being that more fermentation doesn't always mean more funk. This is Monday to Friday, the long treatment, but the effect in the cup is going to be very minimal because what we're just looking for is like clean, bright acidity. This would be an option if, as a producer, you didn't have enough space or maybe it was like kind of cold. And so you wanted to extend your processing for uh, efficiency reasons. They're like, I just don't have enough space on the patio, so I'm gonna do a longer fermentation in my tank until the space is unoccupied, but it's not gonna make the coffee more extreme. I'm actually going to like have a mild effect. So it's like different levers you can pull. Next, the coffee will be dried, which takes about a week. It's called parchment at this stage. Then it will be milled to become green coffee, at which point it can be roasted, brewed, and enjoyed. And that's the lactic process. Please note that this was a descriptive video of what I saw and experienced, not a prescriptive or step-by-step -step guide. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button and make sure to check out the other two videos in the series about the yeast inoculation and the citric process. And subscribe to my channel for more videos about coffee. If you have questions or comments, let me know below. Also, Lucia has a podcast and a Patreon where you can learn a lot more about processing directly from her. Search for Making Coffee with Lucia Solis, follow her on Instagram, Instagram and join her Patreon. And attend one of her fermentation training camps if you get the chance. Thanks so much for watching. Cheers!